I'm still way down. Who's Steph Curry? He is uh, the... Uh, I didn't get any of that. Basketball. Uh, and, and what's wrong with your leg? Uh, he... I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here with you guys. Mm. He's playing in a basketball game now, though. Hmm. So I'm going to assume that he injured it. Sounds legit. Unless it's some sort of death sport basketball game where every time the team, the opposing team scores, you have to cut off a limb. Fair point. That's why I'm a writer, guys. That's why I'm a writer. I'm a writer. I write, I write things. I uh, One day I may share some of my like narration sessions as I go for a walk and I start dictating and i have no idea what to say it's dude a, seems like that would be a good value add for patrons and so on oh no 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 we lose could you get like all right a storyteller she could tell a story as a uh, guy's walking and uh, there's a tree and uh he just passed the tree and uh, uh, uh got a deadline hey hey uh uh you're you're sending audio through your desk mic right god Damn it, Clyde, you dirty ape. Well, whichever one it is, it's super clippy. Yeah, like uh, like whatever level you're sending is, is really uh, blown out. It's, it's through here. I'll automatically adjust microphone settings. Let's try that. Turn that off, yeah. Uh, no, that was off already. Oh. Uh... Is this any better? Hello, I'm going to keep a stream of words going out my mouth hole. And you just let me know what you need me to change because um, things are not working out so well here That's on this good. end. How was that? I think you sound good. That's that's good. All right. Everyone else hates you, but I think you're great. Brian, this is true. This is really true. Hey, Justin, can you give me a little bit of audio? Yo, what's up? How y'all doing? Just talking to you on my mic. What's up? Well, at least, Brian, I don't... I don't... Um... Put spit in my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> Among other orifices. Burn. <laughs> hmm. I do not miss contacts. Uh yeah. Wait, did you get the LASIK or something? Oh yeah, I had a I had a, like sixteen years ago. Wow. And and you haven't needed to re up or anything? Because my parents got it and like twenty minutes later. You know, they were all like, LASIK's the best thing ever. Everyone get it done. And then they're all like, yeah, wish I hadn't done that. Now now I'm uh, blind in other ways. <laughs> wow, no. Yeah, well, I mean, it just like, it, it, you know, it doesn't correct. Uh, uh, well, it, they're emotionally glasses. blind. They're heart blind now. Yeah. They, they, they care not for the mortal world. Yeah, that seems right. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, no, that's a fact. They're uh, they're emotionally dead to the world. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you with this emotional insult about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Brian's like, I'm gonna need a moment, guys. <laughs> a lot of time this weekend. I'm 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 desperate for human contact. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my buddy Ken Montgomery leaves tomorrow for Shanghai. Ah, uh, yes. He's Part of the whole sh Disney opening up. Shanghai. Disney. The Las Vegas of the West. Yeah, but he's going to be there at the Disney park doing the opening for that. So, hmm. If you've seen the photos, you'd be jealous. Oh, dude, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, like they're banking a lot on it. Yeah. <clears throat> the Tron roller coaster. It's like Space Mountain, but you're like riding Tron cycles. Oh, my God. What? Oh, oh! Look up Disney Tron roller coaster. That's awesome. Are they gonna do more Tron movies? Because I liked the world of Tron, if not Tron Legacy. I think I think between you know Tron was one of their investments to try to come up with you know more you know boy sort of brands so to speak, 
And the Disney and Marvel investments have really paid off very well with that. Not to say that girls don't like those two, and that's part of why they're so successful. But, yeah. Um, the Tron movie was just did okay, but certainly worthy it was a of bad a bad movie. They should feel you know, bad. It was part good, part bad. There are parts I liked, and then parts I just didn't. Well, and yeah, no, that's fair enough. I shouldn't, I shouldn't throw the whole thing in the trash. But, uh, but like, there, there were a couple of good set pieces at the beginning and the end were pretty good, and then everything else was sitting around drinking glowing wine, talking about, uh, you know, or moping about <laughs> about whether or not we Very should Matrix try. Matrix Reloaded. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of just dis- high-minded discussions about very, you know, capital letters, very important things that <laughs> well, affect everybody. The the part that I remember so much was Body was just like, uh, like, oh my god, they're gonna go to a party. I wonder what a party in Tron World looks like. Oh, it looks like a really shitty kegger. All yeah. right, <laughs> yeah. that's that. Also, yeah. the. Garrett Hedlund, I don't know if he was ultimately the best leading man decision. In in his defense, um, it's not exactly like he's a character that really had anything to do, you know. Yeah. And it's and it's this. And you're hey, guess what? You're in this movie. Livy Wilds in this movie. Jeff Bridges in this movie. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's the thing. Is that like. Everyone kind of came off as boring, yeah. And he's the least charismatic of the three, and he's the one that we're supposed to be invested in. And it's like, so I mean, I I don't blame him, you know, because it would have taken, you know, some some gigantic effort to make something where, like, as Brian points out, half the movie is spent looking at each other, asking questions that either the plot doesn't want to give you answers to, or uh you know, you aren't all that interesting and to have it be like, oh my God, what a romp, a science fiction feast. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, I'm ready. I'm ready on this end. If y'all are ready on your ends. Let's go. It's true. All right. I don't have any eyes. Take it away in three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. That is a statement of fact that is objectively true, assuming you subscribe to the objective reality that I exist in. And Justin Robert Mad Dog Young. Hey. I, uh, by the way, I'm starting a new nickname. It's uh, the Mad Dog thing. So just go ahead and just refer to me as Mad Dog or Maddie or, or, or D-Dog uh, if you're just taking the D from Mad and putting Wait, it I mean, can, can we call you just Justin Young MD for short? Yeah, that's also mm-hmm. another thing. Uh, or 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 Mad or MD uh, JRY. Uh, gentlemen, laugh it up, enjoy it while you can, because uh, we're about to send Brian on a little adventure. Uh oh, uh oh, where are we going? Oh. Brian, are you spending enough time with your kids? Are they I getting mean, enough quality time? Uh, yeah, yeah, lately it's been pretty good. Uh, we went and saw a magic show last night. I took my daughter to see a magic show. My other daughter didn't want to see magic. I don't blame her. Uh, mm-hmm. we, uh, we went and saw Carbonero. I hate game. what you do for a living, daddy. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, yeah, no, I'd, I'd say it's good. It's good. Lots of time. Uh, what, what else have you done? Uh, we, uh, we, we've, uh, ra- wrestled. We've arm wrestled. I'm, uh, so mm-hmm. far I'm, I'm undefeated. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how about the outdoorsy side of stuff? We talk about going there sometimes. Talk about going there. Yeah. Brian. Maybe, maybe. How about a nice little eco-friendly paddle boat little trip? Maybe a little fishing. Daddy showing showing the girls. Oh, how to, how oh you know fish? what? We, we we do that all the time. We 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 would rent a canoe and we'd paddle down the Comal River and it's nice, crisp, clear, clean water. Feel like you commune with nature. Yeah, we have done that. And fishing, fishing, showing how to fish. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. A little bit of fishing is good. H- have you, you done you, this? Are Brian? you? Do you want to pass on an angler's legacy? Yeah, to, I'll, to I'll say generation. I'll say this is I, I pass on. I don't have anything physical, but I could pass on. I, I say this is the expression I wore as my uncle tried to teach me how to fish. And I just kind of go slack jaw 
like, and then I'm like, that's yours now. And then she gets to wear it anytime she wants. And well, Brian, you know, it's going to be important when the robot uprising happen, happens and they allow just maybe a few maintenance population humans left, you know, to sort of live off the land and survive because they don't want to eradicate us entirely, but they deal dust, do, you know, kill off 99.9% of the population. And, you know, a lot of the crumbling infrastructure sinks like that are going to make it very difficult. You can't just walk into Walmart and buy some cereal. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to teach your daughters how to, well, the one, the daughter that lives, you know, you're going to have to teach her how to, how to fish. I mean, isn't that what the, what the robots will think? Like, this is good stewardship of the environment. We should only have five humans for this uh, 100 hectares or whatever. Probably pretty much, and it's going to be decided by a random algorithm. So it'll just be you and one child. You have to choose. Uh, I mean, does it get to be my child, or does it just pair me with a random other person's child? Uh, you know what? It could be random, but it, you lucked out. It's one of your own. Okay. So, so every time you look in their face, you see the ones that were taken away by the robots, and we don't know what there's happened. There's another robot that's measuring uh, the capacity for human suffering, and so... Like, this is like a side experiment where you have to choose. Uh, oh, you're asking me to choose which kid lives? No, no, I'm not asking you to choose that. Brian, I'm telling you right now, you need to be working on their survival skills. So, okay, so you're saying, like, uh, I should prep all three of them so that no matter which one wins the lottery, they're better yeah. prepared. And, and tell, phrase it like that. Listen, only one of you will survive and it better be the one that's capable of surviving. I got I, I to gotta tell you, I feel like my middle kid wouldn't even need any training. I feel like she could probably start teaching me stuff immediately. Mm -hmm. She's a, you know, you know what she's uh, actually all the kids are in love with. Yeah, I'm, I've already started, Andrew. I'm looking out for you guys. And, and, and normally we don't do picks right at the beginning. But uh, I got all my kids watching the Primitive Technology YouTube channel. Have you seen this? Mm -mm. Oh, my God, it's great. Uh, this dude, uh, I think it's YouTube.com slash Primitive Technology. This guy's uh, an enthusiast of Stone Age technology. He's got a day job. He's got a real gig. But then on weekends, he goes out to the middle of the woods. And the very first episode, you watch him make a, a thatched hut out of just, uh, uh, just grass that he's got laying around. And then you watch him build, eventually, this, this clay-tiled, roofed, uh, a house complete with a heated floor that that has like a, like there's a fire that blasts uh, through a channel underneath and warms the ground underneath him on which he puts a bed he puts an internal he, he um, uh, uh, you watch him fire all the clay tiles he uh, it's 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 amazing oh wow well Brian I was gonna think something a little more simple I think that you you need to teach you know one of your daughters maybe how to fish. Uh, oh yeah, well I, I, that seems like a good idea. That's I mean, what's there to it? You 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 take the hook, you put the worm on the hook, you put the the you put it in the water, you pull it out, and there's a fish. I've seen exactly, I've seen Brian, Popeye. And I've got a video to show you how easy it is. I think Bryce has it queued up here. So just check this out. And I just want to imagine imagine it's you. There's a daughter in back of you. You know, you choose. Um, and you're going out on a little daddy daughter fishing trip where you got a little your little pedal powered boat and you're out fishing. Done and done. So you're out, you're grabbing your line. Check, check pulling in the line. Yeah. Pulling in the line. Pulling up, uh, oh, it feels like a big one. Probably a big oh, old oh, yeah. That's a big ass gator, buddy. Wait, uh, back that up, because that, that looked an big, awful lot like that was an alligator he was pulling by the mouth. Okay. God. By the size of the snout. That is not a small gator. Hey, uh, forgive me for asking, but if I was going to guess what <laughs> state in the United States this took place in, I would probably pick Florida. Uh, good guess. Um, I have no idea. I didn't even bother checking. Um, this I is don't... Uh, Lake, Lake False Point State Park, St. Martinville, Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, I was going to say Louisiana. Uh yeah, that is – and by the way, how amazing is it that we have these moments captured in such high definition? But that almost looks like a a Universal Studios prop, right? Oh, my God. Like, well, and to realize that you're pulling it in, you're actively pulling him towards your boat, and he's not going to be happy. He ain't going to be happy. And by the way, it's just the amazing – like the 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 – the, the the change in posture from him 
pulling, I mean, again, like not beyond just uh, uh, teaching his daughter uh, how to fish, but like good form and pulling it up and staying balanced and everything. And then how much that all goes out of the window as soon as he sees the. He does. He just crumples. River beast rising up to uh, meet him. He just tosses it in and he's just got like both hands up as if it were like a caricature of a like a, a, a 1950s housewife, like like on the top of a chair. Well, it, it's like, it's almost as though it's, it's almost as though he realizes it's the gator cops and he's just saying, I give up. You know, he throws his exactly. hand up. The gator cops show up. He's like, I give up, I give up, and then paddles away with his feet faster like than you would believe possible. Moment. No, that, that's the other funny thing is the speed of his feet is, like, cartoon-esque. Like, as if, like, it was just going to go so fast that a cloud of dust would appear and then his boat would just be out of frame. It's, it's almost like there was no need for the boat. He would just paddle Scooby-Doo style super fast on the surface <laughs> yeah. of the water and then take exactly. off. Yeah, no, no. The, the front of the boat would snap off and it would just be him running on the water. <laughs> uh Although, Nature. by the way, like, they're not not a peep from uh, the, the the daughter on the back of the boat. Yeah. Oh, is that is that a daughter in the back of the boat? Yes. That he's taking. That's the little arm you see wave out over the water right before oh. the gator pops up into the surface. Holy cow! And I, you have to imagine, like we see the teeth and the Careful. snout breach, but you have to believe oh he was God. able to see through the water, like right down to that dude's eyes. Brian, and I think this is why Amazon Prime may be the most important survival invention in mankind. Yeah, this is why this is why I want humans taken out of the equation as soon as possible. Because then, at least after the apocalypse, Amazon Prime will still work. Think you about that. We need Apocalypse Prime. Uh, <laughs> wait, well, like, hold on, hold on. I just that, that's a crazy thought. Think about it. If we hit a certain level of automation, and then a giant uh, meteor strikes and it wipes out a third of humanity survival will mean figuring out clever ways to hack uh, Amazon to be convinced that you still have money and are a good credit risk so that the robots will still deliver goods because like the robots couldn't make a policy decision of like, Oh, we're in an apocalypse. Instead, they're only going to care. Uh, does he have good credit? Yeah. We'll deliver it by drone. Um, like, like in other words, just just like in Apocalypse, uh, y you might stumble across a piece of technology, let's say a, a hand crank um, uh, uh, water pump or something. Water pump doesn't care that there's a, a nuke went off or that a, a, a meteor crashed into Earth. Water, water pump just knows that somebody's cranking the handle and out comes water. I think I think at some level of automation, that's what Amazon would be like, right? I think that that would be the dream. I mean, that's what we were talking about a little bit in the last podcast about the idea of the future of space travel, how it integrates with a fully artificially intelligent automated travel system. The idea that when everything is just fully integrated in that way, that we don't even think about that. And we're starting to see Amazon has warehouses with people and robots and the people have to get out of the way of the robots. And where that moves to, you know, where does that, where does that go towards? And like, yeah, I think that's the interesting idea that a, a, a system that could survive even such a calamity there and designed for that, like the internet was designed to survive, you know, uh, nuclear war. Yeah. I'm, I'm sending you a, uh, you know, one of the first items we could probably have um, is in, for in, food in, supplies. In our new service, Apocalypse Prime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bryce, I'm sitting. Yeah, so Apocalypse Prime. I think we need to think. Start that, but it's going to be a little more pricier than regular Amazon okay. Prime because you have to deal with mutant cockroaches and stuff. Six gallons of this. <laughs> it weighs almost fifty pounds. That's Jim Baker. I know him? you don't want to hear this. Wait, but I want that same you, Jim Baker, the one that was married to Tammy dream Faye. Yep. Jim Baker on TV, telling you get ready, and you say, Oh my God, why didn't I go? And, why didn't I order something? I'm going to eat some more of this. This is terrible. amazing. Uh, for those people not watching oh. the video, we're seeing an infomercial-style mm. uh, overlay on there. A uh, bunch of people oh. standing around oh. watching a full-grown man eat soup oh, from a bucket, uh, uh, talking about how it's only $160 plus blood, shipping right? for for a donation of 160 wow. or more. You could get a bulk uh. bucket of creamy and, potato and soup. Potatoes, uh, 
and for some reason nancy grace is there (laughs) so seven years of food uh, that you can get out of that uh, creamy potato soup uh, bucket but this is I guess all for doomsday preppers. Right? Yeah, you still need clean you got water though, right? You got a, you got a morning cake. I'll for all of this, I assume it's dehydrated. Put that chocolate on top. You can have parties. Yeah. The world's uh, you can have, you still by the way, I just heard like just this, this stray Look wild line of Jim Baker saying you can have a party. Like, like that. This is like, hey, listen. Even in the apocalypse, you got to look out for your social life. You know, these uh. Uh, th- these neighbors are still going to talk whether or not uh, the rest of the planet is dead. So what's the wh- what's the appropriate amount of – so uh, uh, we live in a just-in-time economy, kind of similar to – you know, we've become this singular body where uh, uh, dollars and goods and services flow all over the United States, all over the world, much the way uh, oxygenated blood flows through a human body. And there's certain lengths of time different organs can last without oxygenated blood before they start to die. Um, Like, I think the doomsday preppers have a reputation for being kooky because they want to believe in such thing as complete self-sufficiency. But the only, you know, as as, as one of the things you learn when you read, like, um, uh, The Rational Optimist is uh, the only true self-sufficiency is abject Stone Age poverty, right? Everything else, if you want to actually have any decent standard of living you're going to actually want to have to trade with other people but the question is like where's the line where you go over the edge like what's the difference between drinking for, for soup audio, from a plastic is, bucket just, just barely cubing it together as Jim Baker samples and is so impressed with his creamy potato soup out of a comically large <laughs> Wait, what's funny what's funny is that it's not it's not even like he, he doesn't have it on a, a shelf in front of him he's hunched over like a hobo <laughs> riding the silver rails just scooping from a ladle drinking his creamy out potato of a soup bucket, you know this out is survival i don't want to survive just so pleased um, with it so, and Brian, answer your question. I think that, you know, there certainly is, uh, it depends. I mean, obviously in full out, you know, asteroid impact, dinosaur killer, that's one thing. But, you know, Justin and I grew up in South Florida. And, you know, if you were sensible, you had enough supplies to last for a week or so. You know, you, had, you kept water, you kept these other things because a hurricane would come through. It would take out power. You wouldn't have safe water for a while. Where my parents live, uh, you know, my parents, you know, my parents have a generator. You know, we have friends who have generators mm-hmm. and are able to keep food cold for a while. We've had when Hurricane Andrew hit, you know, we our neighborhood was without power, without anything for like over a week, and there were some neighborhoods were as far as a month, and it and it wasn't just power, but it was like your access, as you point out, like, you know, if you the if supermarkets don't have refrigeration, they're not refrigerating things, and if it's hard to get trucks through because of down power lines and stuff. You know, there's a certain amount of responsibility. Where I live in L.A., you know, if we get a big earthquake, uh, I'm going to die, you know. <laughs> I, I, I accept that. Uh, you know, this is one of the um, – uh, this is an idea that's explored in the, I would say, slightly hysterical uh, – and I don't mean that in a funny sense, but I mean in a overcompensatory uh, way. But the, the novel uh, One Second After deals with the idea of a giant electromagnetic pulse – Um, taking out, uh, you know, all electronic devices. And in the early days of the disaster, it's like, well, none of our refrigerators work uh, and there's no power, so uh, let's just cook up and we'll have, like, a a cookout. And then they have kind of like almost a festival party atmosphere and then flash forward to a year and a half afterwards where there's tribal warfare and then people are like uh yeah my pregnant daughter needs food so we're gonna slaughter our dog now and then and it's uh 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 i guess it's really a question of how long do you want to be covered and at what level of comfort because mm-hmm. I, I i don't know it seems to me like like a, a week of food or a year of food if it's that level of disaster it doesn't seem like it's going to make a big difference one way or the other. Oh, I think I think that the, there's how quickly you can build, rebuild some sort of infrastructure or survival. How quickly can you get something going? And so a week means great. Your week is you're waiting for the government to come in and fix things. A year means you're going to have to figure out things locally. And I think there are a lot of people in Utah that are going to look pretty pretty smug. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, listen, the rest of us are going to be stabbing each other with sharp sticks, and, you know, someone's going to make their way to Salt Lake, and it'll look like the city from Guardians of the, uh, of the Galaxy. It'll, it'll be nicer. For it'll, they'll, they'll have invented things from uh, yes. when the, the apocalypse happened. Yeah. So it, it's it's one of these things, too. There is a interesting cultural difference, too, that the further north a culture lives, you know, that has to deal with lo the longer the winters they have to deal with, you find there's an interesting correlation between their economic success. So, you know, your Scandinavian countries, which are quite prosperous, yet they're freezing, <laughs> you know, well, and it's because they plan. That, you know, they plan for these things. That's certainly, and we've we've seen that not not only uh, uh, with uh, uh, meteorological isolation, but even in you know, like uh, take a look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong essentially had no resources. It had a port and rocks everywhere, and it had a uh, democratic government under uh, you know under uh, British rule, where pretty much everybody just promised two things. They say we're going to drink tea and we're going to enforce contracts, and that's it. And and. In doing so, they maximized that benefit, and they were able to become extremely prosperous. A lot of you know, a lot of trading ports do that, but you know, on a larger scale, some of the places you wouldn't expect to. So, I was going to uh, say, I, I never thought about that, but like you know, if you if you uh, compare and contrast the economic success that some of the Scandinavian countries have had compared to you know, like Greece, Greece. <laughs> like you know that that equator, man, I, I could be a real uh, real son of a bitch. Yeah. I wonder why that is. I wonder what it is about uh, having uh, what they call it. Uh, I guess economists call it the uh, uh, the curse, the curse of abundance, or the or the curse well, yeah, of resources. It, it, it has, if you have to deal with long winters, you have to. You're you're going to be either culturally or maybe perhaps genetically wired towards guys. We need to save a lot of. We need to save seed for when we have to plant it. We need to save food to last us through theirs. And you start investing mental energies and capabilities to figuring out how to preserve. And then you start developing things like banking and the idea of I will put aside some resources now instead of consuming everything I have because I know that six months from now, seven months from now, I'm going to need it. And if winter lasts longer or whatever, and that uncertainty culturally causes this sense of, you know, you know it's almost as though the most civilized forward thinking economies are countries located in places where they're awfully aware that at all times winter is coming. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, that's the kind of messaging you can remember and cuts through all the clutter to remind people of things. Kind of like how Patreon.com slash Weird Things immediately reminds everybody listening to us that they can support this show by heading over to that URL and donating whatever they would like to give to us. See, you know, this is a, uh, a model in which we appreciate your support and, and we are very, very, very happy to have your financial backing. So if you'd like to support us, head on over patreon.com slash weird things. I want to thank all of our supporters, all of our fans, all of our listeners by telling them that I'm disappointed in you people. Uh oh, uh oh, uh -oh. what do they do this time? My Lord. What? I mean, with the language, <sighs> all right, I'm making an indignant face. You're right. I'm trying to sigh as much as I can. <laughs> Well, you know, every time I start to go do the show, I do a little search for things like goblins and other stuff. Uh, I do a little search for ways in which Brian can have his family tortured. And, you know, I do want to see, like, hey, let's, let's get some good ghost photos, right? And so, ooh, the big story of this last couple of weeks is the Stanley Hotel, which, you know, is which, like the model in The Shining. Like, ooh, look at these spooky ghost photos. And Are they good? Are they scary? Are they spooky? Look at Stanley Hotel ghost photo. You tell me. You tell me. All right, hold Do on, your, type does your Stanley. skin crawl? Do you feel the hair on the back of your neck raised? <laughs> so I'm certainly, when you sell it that way, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Um, uh, there's there's one of a guy who's in front of a. Do a news search, actually. Do the news. The, there you go. A First one sign. there, right there. All right, prepare yourself, guys. I'm not responsible for what. Ah! Ah! It's 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 a good-looking young man standing in front of the it's Stanley a, Hotel. He's really handsome. Yeah, neither of them will say he's an Asian dude because it doesn't matter. But that's he's, I think he's very handsome. <laughs> Wait, hold on. There's a circle drawn around. Ah, don't zoom in, please. <laughs> hold on. It looks like. <laughs> Keep going. I I still don't see. Oh, uh, guys. I mean, it looks like what appears to be 
an extended wing. <laughs> I'm, Wait, I'm sorry, guys, I've got to pour a salt circle around myself right now. Uh, okay, I am looking at nothing but a, just a mush of pixels. I don't see how this could possibly be anything. Uh, no, Brian, it's obviously a... No, 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 tell me, what, what is it? What is it, obviously, a, before we a, read the rest? A gigantic turkey baster that has leaned up against the window. Nozzle first. Oh. Okay, but here's the evidence. It wasn't in this other photo that was taken two minutes later. Hold on. Open boom, with. boom, in your face. <laughs> uh, time out. Also, the sun is pointing the opposite direction in the other photo. <laughs> that's uh, two minutes, you say? Well, that's what this the DenverChannel.com article says. <laughs> Suppose, supposes, and then they also make that same examination. <laughs> um. Oh my God, this is maybe the best thing ever. <laughs> but after closer examination, one can see the direction of the shadows cast by the sun differ from one photo to the other. I would say fairly dramatically. We're looking at the difference of, uh, between between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. in the shadows, uh, going opposite directions. Um. So. All right. Uh, uh, <laughs> if we're going to play into it, uh, then obviously this is just a playful ghost that likes to make itself known in very esoteric and weird ways. If we want to be real about it, there was like when I used to work at newspapers at the end of the day, you had to work on something and you had to turn something in because there was a news hole for which you had to fill. And I, I this just to me has like, hey, listen, uh, you got to get something in. And it's like, well, all I got is this stupid Stanley Hotel ghost thing. Yeah, fine. Just put a circle on it. Whatever. <laughs> Are you gonna? <laughs> it's like a yeah. It's a hand drawn. Circle yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to do some? Uh, you want to do some uh, original reporting? Why don't you point out the fact that the shadows go two clearly different directions? Well, guys, I want you to know there's some other photos. If you do a USA Today, your ghost stories from the Shining Hotel in Colorado. USA Today is on the beat, guys, collecting these stories. Let's see. It says here. Call them the McDonald's of news, will you? Your ghost stories from the Shining Hotel. Now, by the way, there's a lot of hotels that allegedly are the Shining Hotel. I assume this is the one that, that what, the uh, that the movie was shot at? or 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 that one was in Oregon, wasn't it? No, I think this one, the Stanley Hotel does have a history, uh, both with The Shining and, and beyond it. I know they do a film festival every year that, like, centers on horror. Yeah, the exteriors were the one in Oregon. Yeah. But but I know that the book was based on another one in, uh, I want to say New Hampshire. I, I did a gig yeah. there once. Uh, I should see if I should. Guys, you just it. passed right by the ghost. Why? And you're... Wait, hold on. Wait, I didn't see uh, any you ghosts. Let's say you're not afraid if you want. That's <laughs> fine. Ghosts. Uh, you just had a photo, and we did a Ken Burns. No, no, back, back. I think Bryce was playing the video of, and it's gone now. Oh, these guys. Oh, it's, it's on the top. Hold on. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Where this is USA Today Network. Can we hear a little bit of the yes, audio we here? Showed you a picture from the Stanley Hotel that appears to show something. And he say a ghost at the top of the staircase of the hotel. A lot of people debating on social media about images of, of the image's authenticity. So we got a professional opinion. We sent the picture to Kevin Sampron, the president and founder of Spirit Paranormal Investigations. He says that in over 90% of cases his team looks into, natural causes are what to blame for what people think is paranormal activity. However, he says this picture is legit. The team found no evidence of tampering or photoshopped. And in fact, they found what they believe is a second ghost. When we blew, blew up the picture of the anomaly, I immediately saw a second anomaly just to the left of the first figure. And so it looks like the first anomaly appears to us to be like a lady dressed in black. And to the left of her, it looks like what is a child. You can see the child's head clearly outlined over the top of the stale ra railing just to the left of the woman in it. Man. <sighs> Kevin says he and his team believe it could be a ghost of a mother and her child. Do you, do you, you know what the you, do you know what the internet has done to ruin everything? It's what? like the lights are always on now. Like there was a there was a good time when I was a teenager when 
I could really scare the pants off myself at two in the morning. I'd, I'd, I'd tuck my head under under my covers because I didn't want to come out because everything, even though I didn't believe in ghosts, they, they, they still scared the pants off of me. But, but then the lights would turn on and you're watching infomercials at three in the morning and suddenly ghosts don't seem as scary. It's like the internet has brought that state of being to a permanent place at this point. I don't know, Brian. You're not going to the right websites. Oh, yeah? I mean, yeah. Well, all right. Humanity. So where do we start here? <laughs> do we start with just like these kinds of photos in general? Do we start about, you know, the fact that this is a story that takes up X amount of time on a local news station and the only people that they send the picture to are the spirit informational squad uh, for whom uh, they're like, I swear to God, man, I swear, baby. I never talk to these girls, but you are special. In fact, I see a second ghost. <laughs> I mean, there's part of me that's jealous of him that he's able to scare. I mean, one of the most fun times I've ever had in my entire life was staying overnight at Wolf Manor. Uh, one of the first times I hung out with Brett Rounceville, and mm -hmm. it was me and C.J. Johnson and Captain M.G., um, uh, it was amazing, scaring, scaring the crap out of ourselves. I okay, can understand the appeal of that lifestyle. Uh, do you think that that is the interaction for him, or is it for him, like, proving that his that he's right? Yeah, and 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 looking at a bunch of random noise and finding, you know, the the, the pattern that that he has sworn to everybody else is truly there. Well, you here's what I suspect. You hear a lot of people whenever they talk about the paranormal, whenever they hit upon that brick wall that separates the, yeah, but there's no evidence for it. And then they respond, um, yeah, but I have this feeling or, or the, I, I know the feeling I have is real. That feeling they have is, is the beginnings of an argument that they've made in their own mind and that they have scared themselves or, or, or spooked themselves or gotten themselves into a state of mind where they're like, hey, yeah, dude, I feel it. I feel it really, really strongly. And then they, they try to go to the second level of like, can you take that feeling and expand it to another person? Can you give someone else that feeling by telling the right story and making the right case? Because like, for example, here, throw, let's throw the, that image back up there. I mean, if you look at it just right, if I tell you that there's a gorgeous young woman in a black dress looking leftward over her shoulder, the more of this I do, the more of it you can kind of see her and draw it. And it's as though you're, you're, uh, you're, you're creating something in there. And I think that there's a, there's an electricity of that moment when you see it, uh, either for yourself or when you get someone else to see it, that I think is, is highly addictive. I think, I think that's a big part of, of why somebody goes into this full time. But I mean, that's, that's the same part of the brain that likes magic eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Like, like that it, it, it's, it's random noise until it appears to you. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, agreed. And and magic tricks while we're at it. You know, it's like, uh, what is a magic routine? But like seven unrelated odd movements for people to do uh, that all come together in the last part when they add up to something like, wait, I saw the seven pieces that went into this and there should be a, a bloody body cut in half right now. And there's not. And, and it's that novelty that gives you that that aha serotonin rush. And I think that's really what when when you were laying out and for for those of you, all right, uh, d d uh, describe uh, the the uh, uh, EVP for uh, for for people who may not have seen you live. Oh, uh, you're you're talking about the uh, the stage routine? Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, EVP is easily my favorite thing I ever wrote. Uh, it uh, basically it starts off with an explanation, kind of an overview of what the idea of electronic voice phenomenon is. Uh, the, the idea of ghosts getting caught on tape. I I would play some clips of what were allegedly ghosts uh, being caught on audio tape. That uh, you know maybe it's just random noise or artifacts. Uh, then you you look at static and you can see faces in there and so on. And then uh, and then I would tell a particular story, and in at this point is very much uh, just a made up ghost story about a couple that lived in a house by built by a man in the late 1800s, died around the mid 60s, and they had one experience where they were watching TV, uh, and all of a sudden the si signal went crazy, but they happened to snap a photo during the middle of that, and um, uh, they when they got back to the developed photo, they said they could see a face in there. So. Uh, I, I, I play the tape, and the first time you watch it, you see nothing extraordinary. The second time, I say, watch it again. This time, watch it through your cell phone camera. If you see something weird, try to get a picture of it. And uh, the second time, it's it's 
the most amazing response I ever got on my stage show's history because, you know, people would start screaming and shouting and pushing on each other because half the people didn't see anything, but the other half on their phone, plain as day, see this really creepy, haunting ghost and, face show. As somebody who's watched that routine a bunch of times, there is a, a reliable element of there might be a riot that breaks out from this. Like, there is an almost, like, weird, dangerous, unstable, jagged edge for that energy, which is so rare with a magic trick because, like the like looking at these photos, it is personal. I've discovered something. The person that is holding up the phone has has uh, discovered something or seen something. Uh, it, it and and that just makes this weird rumbling where uh, it's it, it, it's it's flirting. It's 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 flirting on the edges of a manufactured hysteria. Right. It's it's a bit of that uh, that, that that mosh pit feeling of that vibe. I mean, part of it is that I insist on everybody packing together as close as they can. Part of that is for the practicality of if if the ghost doesn't show up on one phone, it'll at least show up on the phone next to him. The other part of that is when somebody next to you is panicked on your right and somebody on the left is panicked, panic is infectious, right? And you want a little bit of that panic to start to arise. Well, speaking of infectious panic, I have a little more background on the Stanley Hotel. Okay. okay. Go. That is where Stephen King stayed and got the idea for The Shining, or The Shining, as we say. <laughs> he says from his Look website, Superboy. In the late September of 1974, Tabby and I spent a night at the Grand Hotel in Estes Park, the Stanley. We were the only guests, as it turned out. The following day, they were going to close the place down for winter. Wandering through its corridors, I thought it seemed the perfect, maybe the archetypical setting for a ghost story. That night, I dreamed one of my, th I dreamed of my three-year-old son running through the corridors, looking back over his shoulder, eyes wide, screaming. He was being chased by a fire hose. I woke up with a tremendous jerk, sweating all over with an in inch of falling out of bed. I got up, lit a cigarette, sat in a chair looking out the window at the Rockies, and by the time the cigarette was done, I had the bones of the book firmly set in my mind. <laughs> Uh, the yeah, book uh, was, was Stand By Me. <laughs> uh, that whole period, I believe that's around the time he wrote, uh, I guess that was the beginning of it. Uh, he refers to this decade-long period where in his life, this is also when he was high a lot, when he was drunk a lot, he couldn't think of anything more terrifying than just something bad happening to his children. So as a result, uh, that's when he put in Cujo, where the book ends with the, with the kid dying, and uh, uh, he, he put um, you know Pet Cemetery involves a toddler getting run over by a giant truck and all that stuff. It's just like basically the most horrible stuff happening to his own children all made it into that decade of books. I found the original Instagram photo for the the lobby photo for it's Aries A R E S four fifteen, and you can find the photo there, and it's uh, not much more clear. A R E S, yeah. Uh, A R E S four one five on Instagram. Instagram yeah. Oh, it looks like it's locked up, private. No, not for me. If Wait. we have a link, this would uh, kill a lot of this dead air. Oh, here we go. There, oh, there we got it. Yeah. I mean, that just looks like a woman at the top of the stairs, right? A woman in a Doctor Who TARDIS costume. Yeah. And all, all <laughs> she has to do, all, all you have to do to make this a terrifying thing is say, but there was no woman there. Yes. So, all right. Serious ghost hunters on the planet, right? With where technology has gone and our understanding that even digital photographs can often create very weird, unexplained artifacts. Like, what would be our burden of proof to see, to catch a ghost? Well, well. so, here, so here, here's the unfortunate thing, is that the most credible ghost photos are the least inspiring, because a good ghost photo has a great story that that builds up a lot of credibility, has a narrative that that sets up the idea that you might see something and has that payoff of like, and this is the photo I captured at the end. And then you get chills because you have the context and the backstory for it. So you have to know who died, right? It's, a, it's not just like, oh, I found this photo and then it's just, you know, like Dave Foley and Brain Candy. Like, who, me? I'm just a guy. Oh, I died a while ago and I'm just a ghost. No real story for me. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that's part of what makes it so infectious as a, uh, you know, essentially like a, a viral 
ghost story at that point. It's it's interesting how many of these photos you find out. They're, like I said, the good ones usually be they didn't. There was nothing at the time. And then afterwards, they look through there and they see something weird, and they go look up the history of the place. And like, oh, so back to my earlier point and my disappointment with everybody. I want you guys out there to send us your best ghost photos. Yeah, yes. and make sure to make sure to include good stories with it. I don't want to yes. see no orbs. That's why I hate orbs. Orbs are like. Here's a dot. It's like, yeah, look, I'll, there's plenty of pictures that have dots. You have an orb if you swear there was no other light source in the room. <sighs> or, yeah. or, or at least have a good story about how uh, will-o'-wisps used to be famous in that area or something, and then you caught one or something. Or at least say it was Ghost Writer, not Ghost Rider. <laughs> ghost Writer? <laughs> he's got he's got the flaming skull head. He's just like, oh, my publisher will love this. Oh, Click you, you ever saw Ghost, ghost Writer? No. Ghost Rider was a children's show where a little glowing orb would would fly in and and write things. And oh, it would that's amazing! That's awesome. All right, gentlemen, do we have time for one more topic, or do you want to jump into picks? Uh, yeah, no. Let's let's do another topic. Yeah. You know, we touched on this last time, and I want to I want to I want to ask you your thoughts on this. We mentioned Project Starshot which was this it's this ambitious idea Yuri Milner's funding this project to build this massive to start you know the development of a massive laser array that can then project phase array beams onto a meter wide reflector and send a payload to the nearest star system Alpha Centauri within 15 to 20 years right right crazy mm -hmm. idea of interstellar probes is awesome it's interesting this week there was another Another one of those articles, you're like, man, this would be really cool if this was true. It's the, you know, the EM drive. The EM drive is this theoretical propulsion system where it uses this sort of conical shaped cavity. And there's like a microwave emitter at one end. And it's supposed to have, it's supposed to move forward without emitting any mass, which. It just uh, can't, that, that just can can't be, right? I what's mean. That? That that violates the laws of conservation of mass and energy, right? Uh, effectively, I mean, you can you can shoot a laser beam out the back, and you're going to have you know some sort of propulsion. But this isn't like that. This is actually supposed to be far more powerful than photonic propulsion by the amount of energy you're putting into it. It's not emitting anything, but somehow it's moving forwards or whatever. And that's the problem: is that it violates, you know, what we know about physics. And so it's been rejected out of hand by many people who are like, "Hey, no." But a number of laboratories around the world have done some investigations into it, and they have reported. Uh, non non zero uh, measurements and including NASA's Eagle Works has been doing research into this. Other places have been doing this, and it could be experimental error. You know, there's so you know it, it's more likely to be experimental error. And there is some report that we may be getting a a write up coming out soon from a laboratory that's reported that they have have actually had positive uh, experience. They have positive results on this. There is a theory floating out there uh, by a physicist who says that he thinks that it can be explained by something about like cower theory, which has to deal with how inertia works, and that it doesn't really violate the law. You know, the idea that the way inertia is created, this is actually something that capitalizes on that. These are things that are beyond me, and uh, oh, unru radiation is one of the explanations that somebody's thrown out there, and you can. Listen, I can I poured through you know the pros and the cons and all these sorts of things and a lot of really really gifted PhD high level people are having a back and forth about this and all I can say is man this is interesting you know I like skittles so <laughs> if this but this is still it's a very interesting area of research and there's other things that are more conventional there's plasma uh, plasma rockets, we talked about before. There's a company called Positron Dynamics, which is trying to develop antimatter technologies. My question is this. All of this comes to this. Should we be spending, like, like way, way, where right now we have a program called the SLS, the SLS, which is this big, huge rocket system, which is based on old kind of shuttle and Saturn V technology, which is our plan to go back into space, but we don't really have a plan to actually go back into space other than to see if this rocket works. Should we be doing more ambitious, you know, spending billions of dollars on developing all these crazy kinds of technologies? Uh, okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> and by we, 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 we mean NASA. We mean the federal NASA. government. Yeah. I mean, if NASA has any mandate in space, I would say its responsibility is to further and hasten our 
reaching out to the stars by doing the things that commercial enterprises won't. Commercial enterprises, uh, you know, for, for all the, 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 the eye rolling that we give um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson for being so anti, you know, pro-government, anti-commercial uh, uh, space exploration, uh, he is right in that, um, you know, commercial governments pioneered a lot of that early explore, exploration, and now we're at a point where private industry is benefiting from it. So that's great. So what is private industry not doing yet because it's not cost effective? They are, they are not building permanent structures on celestial bodies and it seems to me that's what nasa's number one benefit could be contribution to humanity is to to hollow out an asteroid to build a lunar base to to get us us out there and to you know go ahead and use private industry as the fairies that that get us out of the gravity well but um uh but but mainly it's insane to us that we would crawl out of a gravity well to grab resources just to pull them back down into the gravity well with us. It seems like we should be building facilities out there that use the resources out there. That's what it seems like to me. Well, my my question that gets back into is, is that there are a lot of these riskier sorts of things, these more exotic forms of propulsion and stuff. And I don't I'm not saying EM drive, but other things, plasma, stuff like that. And NASA does, to their credit, provide some seed funding, developmental funding for this. But there aren't much bigger initiatives, and there might be a reason why that would be a bad idea too. But I would take I would say something like Project Starshot, which uses existing technologies, which is which is an engineering thing. It seems to me that's the kind of thing that we should be looking into instead yeah. of you know for the for the price of what we're going to be spending on the SLS, we could have an infrastructure capable of sending probes to other star systems and putting things all around our solar system very very quickly. So. Uh I'm just a simple country bumpkin that uh, doesn't know much about federal governmental budgets, but the SLS seems like something that in an era where NASA did not have anything on the books for space travel or had to pay uh, Russia to get up into space seemed like something that was big and meaty and aggressive enough that it could continue to justify its budgetary uh, uh, thirst uh, in a world pre, you know, SpaceX, you know, proving that a lot of what they are doing is is indeed real and the idea of uh, a, a, a far cheaper way of getting into space uh, from an American private industry was more of a realistic solution. So if we are then to say like, OK, well, let's let's say over the next three years we see. Uh, NASA may be uh, cool on, on what they'll do with, with, with SLS or, or maybe the vision is scaled back and therefore you need, you know, NASA's not just going to give back earmarked money. Like you got to think, okay, well, what else are we going to do with it? What else are we going to ask for that continues to uh, keep the line up on the budget that they do have, which I'm sure everybody, you know, there is a large portion of this uh, crap. I mean, they can't. Congress has said you have to build this thing because the okay. Congress critters who voted for this thing are the ones that have, they're going to be getting the bulk of the budget spent in their states. Yeah. Like their my my that, county is the one that makes the sprockets that, that allow the gyroscope to spin the shuttle leftward. Sure. So then forget that scenario. And, and, and I think what I was trying to get to was uh, the idea that is would it be better if I I do agree with you, Andrew? I mean, I think that like they're like trying to figure out new uh, propulsion methods. There's there's you know little downside, and, and and if we look at the argument of like, hey, look, let's just put time, effort, research, and and a budget toward solving problems that that can't that you know may or may not be solved because. They're not cost of effective enough that or cost effective enough that a private industry is going to dive in and try to find that monkey. Then I'm down for that. Well, that's and I guess that's the thing that's for me is I find frustrating is that there's so much awesome stuff that NASA is doing in so many different areas. And then, you know, there's a certain amount of excitement over SLS because its payload capabilities will increase a lot of things. But then you look at it and you go, OK, here it is. We're 2016 and we are building the most expensive disposable rocket ever. And that's that is the biggest biggest part of NASA's budget. That's the biggest part of NASA's mandate, is to ignore you know all these radical developments that have happened in the last 40, 50 years, and to say no, we're going to build the biggest pork project ever. Well, and and a lot of that is you know the people behind the SLS are are you know the usual suspects for people yeah. that 
you know, build these kind of government contracted items, right? Like this is this is just a, an extension of that relationship. I guess, and I guess that's the thing where when there's a dialogue about, hey, NASA needs more money, I get frustrated because I'm like, I'm for that, but let's talk about how it's being spent. So I was at the California Science Space Science Center, and they're upstairs, and they have this little exhibit where you can put like, this is put a token there for this little slot for how much money you think NASA should get, and then we're going to show you how much they get, you know, and and people are like, oh, it's a shame. I'm like, well, we spend five times in all of Europe, you know, so I, we, we there's got to be a metric there. My frustration is like, does it matter to you how it's spent? Are you asking questions about how it's spent? If you're not, it doesn't matter how much money you put into it. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Uh, hey, so uh, I'm I'm running up against a, a deadline. Can we move into picks? I have I have an unconventional one this week. Guys, why don't we move into picks in case somebody has a deadline? <laughs> uh, so I got an email. I just forwarded it to uh, both of you guys and to Bryce, who has amazingly already put together a link for it. But longtime listener uh, to the show and I believe patron, uh, Paul Freeland, writes me the following letter that I thought was really interesting. He says, hi, Brian. Got a little behind on weird things, finals week, moving house, etc., and just caught up today. I heard you and Andrew starting to discuss the issue of a constraint-free economy and universal basic income, something I've been looking into. I admit that some of my interest may be motivated by being a college student who's juggling four jobs just to pay the rent, though it's a fascinating idea all by itself. Apologies for sending this so close to the next episode, but here are some of the links I've bookmarked if you'd like some more material on the subject. Some of them deal with tangential but possibly related subjects such as the minimum wage and other things that would need reconsidering if UBI is brought into play. I think that I have an idea uh, which way the discussion on the podcast will, will go, but you never know. And he just gives me this mother load of Slate articles, freethoughtblogs.com article, independent articles, The Nation articles, New York Times articles. Uh, so just now, uh, I, I have I have not read all this, but this is, this is an amazing question. And it's a big question I'm sure we're going to talk about for a long time. What happens when humanity wins so hard? that it theoretically breaks the rules of capitalism, or at least some people would suggest that. And, and you know, I, 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 we, I don't want to drag us into it right now, but I do think it would be a fun reading project for us to, to read all these. Uh, I would and, love to know which of the ones are pro and which are the ones con, so we can go back and forth. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, and uh, uh, Bryce put it together. If you go to bit.ly slash constraint free, that'll take you a list, uh, a link to, or that'll link you to the list of all of his links. Uh, that might be a fun kind of a group reading project that we can maybe argue about next week on it. Yeah. Again, my, 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 again, my knee jerk reaction is, I started from the point of view of reading all things like why this is a great idea, da 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 da, and then I said, ah, let me read into some of the anti arguments for this just so I can see. And then I'm like, oh my god, this is there is about a scary thing. So that that's kind of my question is that I, I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to put this out there until we know that hey, here's the pro and here's the con because I don't want to be pushing all of the yeah, this is all why it's a good idea. Oh no no no, I I, I don't I mean I I I I. Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Let's let's uh, let us discuss. I know, but I say we should also be accumulating just so we know, you know, not because it's very easy. Like I in the constraint free stuff, when I watch the TED talks, and all this, I'm like, yeah, this sounds invetable. This sounds very. And I got into that echo chamber. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no. And this makes sense because robots have this da da da. And then I started listening. I'm like, but let me let me be a good critical thinker and let me go outside and go listen to the hey, no, this is why it's a horrible idea. Well, okay, hold on. So, I guess so let, let let's just all understand that this is Paul Freeland. He has curated these. Uh, we do not know Paul's point of view or his sorting method, but uh, if if it is tilted one way or another, blame Paul. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I certainly. Uh, I I mean, I say let, let's read everything. Read all the things. Uh, let's not wait uh, for any reason. Let's let's put it all out. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying yes and try to seek dissenting opinion on this because I'm already looking through this. Uh, and they are, I would say, uh, when I read the phrase libertarian lunatics in one of the essays. To, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm attracted to that. That, that immediately makes me uh, want to look and read more. Is, is... Well, I'm, I would say that yes, Brian, but I would also love to hear the libertarian lunatic point of view too. Sure. I, I, I'm, I'm here anytime you need me. Yes. You're you're an anarchist, Brian. It's fine. <laughs> Gentlemen, that is Brian's pick. By all means, of course, do there. Let's let's have a discussion about this. Be good. And like I said, whenever something really appeals to you, go listen to the dissenting opinion because 
there's emotional arguments are the most persuasive and they're also the least based in fact. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, the part of the reason I'm attracted to all this is because I don't believe there is uh, uh, I don't want to get it political. It doesn't matter. I, I, I almost certainly disagree with all these, which is why I, I like I'm excited about reading them. My picks Beyonce. <laughs> what what happened last night? I just saw I got this alert from HBO saying Beyonce's important. And then all of a sudden all of Twitter was like, thank God for Beyonce. And I'm like, what what is happening? Oh, you missed it, Brian. Uh so uh Beyonce debuted her album. She's got a new album coming out, and, and like what she did on her last album, she only had very, very minimal pre-press for it and and kind of dropped it out of nowhere last time. This time, there was a little bit of pre-press that she was going to do a one-day-only uh, sh- show of some sort uh, on HBO on Saturday night. Uh, what you found out as you watched it was that it was basically her entire album interspliced with, like, poetry, and and it was shot very, very well. It's a lot of really good music videos put together into one seamless thing. And then she dropped her album while it was airing on the East coast. Um, so I- I'm not a, I'm not a huge Beyonce fan. Like, I don't know if I've ever listened to a Beyonce album all the way through, but everybody was yelling and screaming about it. And uh, I watched it and I thought it was, uh, thought it was really good. So considering I think that it's, it's uh, going to be off HBO. Uh, I mean, at least, I don't know, whatever, whatever fake window they've uh, created for how long that thing's going to be there. I'm sure it'll be on the Internet forever. But uh, it was interesting. It was cool. And I always like people trying to do, especially big artists, you know, trying to release things in in new and different ways, Uh, because I think it's very interesting when people are, are trying to, like, inch around the way of like, okay, what's a great new model for distribution in in 2016? And I feel like people are getting closer and closer to it and no one's really hit it, but you're getting some really interesting uh, experimentation that I think we'll miss when things kind of harden up uh, over the next five, 10 years. And there's just a very clear way to release an album. Right on. Gentlemen, imagine a plot like this. Three men, mysterious men arrive in Moscow on a Learjet and try to buy an ICBM missile. A man dressed in a leather trench coat shows up in the garage of a rocket designer asking him suspicious questions about the technology. Is this the plot to uh, the Chevy Chase Dan Aykroyd movie, Spies Like Us? No. Okay. Uh, A man in Utah who had previously arrested by the Russians for trying to sell international secrets gets approached by a man claiming to be a billionaire asking for his help in securing a weapon. What? Sound familiar? No. What is this? This is the Elon Musk biography. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so Ashley Vance, who's a pretty pretty well known uh, writer, is uh, wrote, wrote a biography Elon Musk, and I hesitated for a while because when it came out, there was you know a bit of the back and forth where Musk was frustrated by some of the portrayals, and they're predictably so. Uh, and actually at one point, but it starts off where Vance says Musk had asked to be able to do like a footnote rebuttal to everything in there. And Vance is like, no, I have a, my journalistic integrity. Although part of me is like, well, that would be a better book though. Wouldn't it though? You know, is that, is that, you know, you write your thing and let Musk have his response to it. So I'm part way into this and it is an extremely, a lot of times I'm hesitant, like we like how star Wars conquered the universe. I'm like, I know the star Wars story. And then nope. Way more than I realized. This is a fascinating book that goes into the Musk's childhood. It talks to people very close to him. There is a point of view. You know, Vance has a point of view on this, but I would say that he is, uh, unlike the uh, the Steve Jobs bio, where you realize the guy writing it, you know, had no grasp of Jobs and really what is what he did. Um, this is, I thought, is so far very, very good, very, very detailed. And, and I, I, I know anecdotal stories about Musk from friends, and a lot of it matches up to what I've heard. But it's fascinating. It's an absolutely fascinating story. And, you know, the, the fact that when he was first trying, he wanted to, you know, put a greenhouse on Mars and wanted to do these things. And he's trying to buy rockets and try to get involved in this stuff. And the story of those early days of SpaceX, how it wasn't a given. He's like, oh, now I'll build a rocket company. It was you're dealing with all these frustrating things, trying to buy rockets and realizing how problematic the industry is. 
there's amusing stories like when he uh i think when he sold like his company zip 2 he went out and bought himself a mclaren f1 which is the fastest production car there is and he would drive it every day like just drive it around for like a regular car which other mclaren you know car owners are just aghast at and sure he, he sent an email to larry ellison because he heard ellison had one and said hey do you want to go take them to the track and race them and which prompted Jim Clark, one of the prolific investors, to you know go race down to the Ferrari dealership to buy something that he could compete with. <laughs> and uh, Musk takes somebody for a drive. They're on their way to a meeting at like you know Sand Hill, which is the big VC uh, avenue. And he's they're in the car, and Musk says, "Watch this!" Swerves the car, skids around, hits, catches air, hits an embankment, and all the windows shatter. Whoa! And Musk turns to him and says. The funny thing is, it's not insured. <laughs> Dude, that's a guy that's having too much fun with life. That's awesome. Yeah, and it, but and it's funny, too, because they talk about, like, you know, the Vance will say, like, you know, in those early days, he would say the typically rich guy douchey things in interviews and stuff. And uh, you get insight into his childhood in South Africa. He was bullied tremendously. One point, hospitalized after some kids shoved him downstairs. Very, very traumatic childhood. And he spent, he was desperate to come to America. That was his plan. And when he found out that because of his mother's like Canadian ancestry, he could get Canadian citizenship, 17 years old, gets a plane ticket, flies to Canada, shows up trying to find, because he figures Canada's close to the United States, tries to find a relative, then finds out that they'd moved to Minnesota. So he's basically bumming, you know, places to, you know, hitchhiking, bumming places to stay. I don't know if you said check in. I maybe threw that in there. Places to stay from relatives and all that. Spends a year in Canada working odd jobs like stoking coal furnaces and chopping wood and doing just about all the most menial, hardworking stuff you can imagine because he's desperate to sort of make a new life. That is so. amazing. Uh, my, I, I was about to ask if there's an audio version, and I see there's audible there narration is. right there. Yeah, excellent. That's what I'm listening to right now. Good deal. Dude. So. Great pick. That's my temporary pick right now until uh, well, until you know Vance disappoints me. But no, I think it's it sounds it's so far. I've been, I felt like Vance seems like you know reading into it kind of like well is is seems to be trying to be objective about their subject. But uh, I don't it doesn't feel like a hit piece at all. Although Musk probably feels differently, and we'll see where it goes on to it later on. So. Interesting. And that's my pick. Sweet. It it's been weird. Awesome. Uh, hey, I need to run to the restroom very hey, badly. Hey, me too, Brian. Let's see if we can time it together. Mm, three, two, one, go. Did you watch the uh, the Beyonce thing, uh, I Bryce? I did. I I, uh, I didn't realize when it was going to start, um, or rather, I got, like, the notification on my iPad about it, uh, and so I think I was watching it um, a little later than everybody on Twitter was. Oh, yeah. I wound up watching it later in the evening, uh, especially because most of my Twitter was uh, East Coast, so they were all watching it at 6 o'clock my time. Oh, right. I, I think it was really good. Um, it's... It, it's a, the kind of thing that she did this a little with the that last album too, where the music videos aren't like aren't always the whole song. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of that like in the first half or so, and um, and and I only I only felt a little upset because it was really good, um, and I just wanted to hear some of those some of those songs even more. But Wait, I was so great. You had heard those songs already? No, I hadn't. But uh, just like the little inter the interruptions and just some of them being like not full length. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but it was gorgeous. The un those underwater scenes, just crazy. Yeah, I I, I really I want to know who directed each one of them because there was a lot of famous like uh, like uh, Jonas Ackerlin right uh, directed one of them and uh, I want to know who directed what. Uh, it was I thought it was really really well done and and it obviously you know has that sheen of you know listen either it is. Uh, real drama, or it is expertly Written. crafted fake drama. Yeah. Um, 
that will then, of course, invariably cause real drama. But um, yeah, it was just great watching Twitter. Just be like, Jay Z, you sc- you effed up, man. What did yeah. you do? I mean, you know, there's a. Uh, I mean, especially considering you know that that they had uh, you know a, 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 the the public gossip rumors and everything last year. Yeah, with um, Rachel Rachel Roy. Well, I mean, that's yeah, that's that's who everybody is kind of glomming on to now, uh, and, and and that was a, a a thing. But also, when it first happened, it was like Rihanna and uh, Rita Ora and everything. Like, there's like been a few people that that were that were linked to him. So now, like, people are seizing on the Rachel Roy thing because she had some you know snarky Instagram post or something last night when it happened. Yeah. Uh, but whatever it is, man, like, you know, uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more on, on on the jury show, but it is a fascinating kind of element because Jay-Z, obviously uh, a huge investor in title. Right. Uh, now the, the album's going to come to iTunes, the store, but not Apple Music. So title will still be the place where you can stream it. Right. Yeah, I just saw this while we were Googling it, which is weird because the report that I saw like earlier today was like, no, nah, it's going to stay on title like um, uh, that uh, the song she did with Nicki Minaj. Um, yeah. Feeling myself. Um, but like so she's I mean, it, it still is going to have it like people. she's still going to be pushing people to title. The title is going to be the place where, you know, she's going to want to incentivize people to go there. Which is is so weird that let's assume for a second that there are truth to these rumors and this is her making, uh, you know, this is like you're just going full Fleetwood Mac of like, no, we're going to take our personal problems and put them out for the world and make art out of them. Like that this is the thing that, you know, will will carry title or hopes to carry title is like Jay-Z's own personal ample foibles. Yeah. Is just uh, is, is 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 super fun to think about. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to to rewatch it or or just listen to the album as a whole, um, because they they do they it, it's being sold as a concept album. So you know some some people were hypothesizing that it was maybe meant to represent for the point of view of her grandmother, who's at the end of Lemonade. The yeah the, yeah, or her mom. I saw I saw that there was like you know that that that. It's her and her sister that are the lemonade to the lemons of of the bad marriage or whatever yeah. um and that would make sense that it's like oh are you talking about your father or your husband as if she's from her mother's perspective or whatever i don't know i thought it was really good uh you know and it was re- it was it was it was exceptionally well shot um, oh my gosh all those the all of the use of fire uh a lot of fire a lot of fire uh and uh yeah, the underwater stuff was was just crazy. I tell you what, that country song is hot. That's pretty good. Yeah, I liked it. It, it. it sounded like the 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 title song of a uh you know of a of a of a western or something. Like I'm sure it'll be used in every western trailer, you know, mm-hmm. for the next three years. Uh, all right, BRB. Okay. Hey, Andrew. Hello, Bryce. Do we have any more uh, after things uh, uh, weird tank? No, we haven't received any this week, unfortunately. I right. really asked, so I gotta. Uh, someone was saying earlier, because uh, the bit.ly link for Brian's thing is a paste bin, and someone sent me the bridge URL, but it seems like that side is not exactly working, so unfortunately. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, Sorry guys. Are you are you in the Game of Thrones? You're in the Game of Thrones. Yeah. Usually in the Game of Thrones. Usually. So you you must be super looking forward to the premiere then. Trying to temper my expectations. Ah, uh, good. That's great advice. That's good general advice. I feel like. Brian got caught up in something. Yeah, I was gonna try to just, you know. Hold on. 
You guys see um, uh, Paximania this morning? People in the chat room. It's wild. I watched a little bit of it. I watched the end. Uh, I was hoping to catch Carboni, but I, I guess I, I woke up too late for it. Yeah, he was only on there for a few minutes. If you go, let me see. Chat bomb on archive. They've, they've already got a copy of the stream up on YouTube. Uh, it's on this I'll tell you what. The one thing that, that, that they definitely uh, uh, demonstrate is how efficient actual professional wrestling is in terms of timing things out. Because... Uh, <laughs> That was uh, definitely something that by the end they had to like rush all their big. But, but at the point I was watching, they had to rush literally like everything that they had built everything up to because that was at the end and they had to clear out of a panel. Yeah, which uh, has happened the past few times too. So uh, this is this is for what? Uh, the Paximania. Paximania oh yeah, two, yeah, yeah. Pax East. Uh, it was great. They because it's set up to be like, oh hey, we're gonna play a wrestling video game and then do all the real wrestling drama outside of it. But like, they legitimately had like maybe three minutes of actually playing anything, because uh, there was just so much like hobnobbery theatrics going on, which is great. But uh, yeah, fun stuff, fun stuff all around. Oh my God, where did that come from? Oh, oh you spooked me. Oh, you scared me, right? Oh, you scared me, right? <laughs> Strength ask if OMG Chad was in it. No, OMG Chad is on like. Their official bumpers and stuff for for Pax. He's doing all sorts of interviews and guest segments and stuff. Super excited hey for him. All it, right on. And he looks a lot uh, like Mark. Now McGuire. that he's back in his uh, his his home state, his power looks, grows wait, larger. He, he said he looks like Mark McGuire. No, Markiplier. Oh, Markiplier. Got he it. looks nothing like Mark McGuire. Okay. I was very confused. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys want to do some after things? Mm-hmm. Uh, you are still muted, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is this any better? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's you keep doing do that. Let's go with that. All right. <laughs> All right, take it away in three, two. <sighs> Welcome to the After Things podcast. Sorry, right? hold on, hold on. Oh time, time out. I was definitely <laughs> mid-yawn. I was audibly yawning just as you started. I don't want that to be how it starts, unless we make a big... time. I was stretching it out because you were yawning. <laughs> oh, you bastard. I was helping you out, right? No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is the dysfunctional relationship that we have here. <laughs> uh, should I start again? Cause yes. The... Yeah, I'll take it again. <laughs> Oh. Three, two. I counted myself in, Bryce. Well, I thought that's your. Oh, boy. <laughs> Must I do everything? <laughs> okay. Three, two. Welcome to the After Things podcast, the podcast that comes after weird things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Brian Mad Dog Brushwood. Oh, they call me Brian MD for short. Oh mm. man, I already got my my gimmick. Sorry, man. I went to I went to <laughs> medical heat. school. You gotta live up to it. So, gentlemen, you know, there is a person who I think is a very fascinating entertainer. He's an extremely talented uh, comedian, actor, who I think has been pushing the envelope. We'll forget the fact that he was the director of Pootie Tang. And remember, I'm talking you about remember Louis and celebrate him as the director of Foodie Tech. <laughs> yes. So he has done some very ambitious things. Like he took, you know, he released a an entire, you know, comedy special on his website for like five bucks and it was a huge success. He's then tried, I think, to replicate that to some extent with other comedians and all that, but I don't think it's quite worked. I don't I won't say that it didn't work as well, but I don't think it had the same degree. And then he decided to try, I think it was a very, very brave thing, and that was he created a TV show called Horace and Pete. We call it a TV show because we don't have better words for it. Uh, and it uh, starred him, uh, cast included Steve Buscemi and a bunch of others. 
And he decided to, he did it a surprise, he paid for it out of pocket, shot this thing, and then unleashed it on the world, basically on his website and an email, says, hey, I've got this thing called Horace and Pete, come and get it. It's like, I think five bucks an episode or something like that. It was sort of at this pricing structure that was a little bit interesting. And by accounts of reviews of people who've watched this, a lot of critics praised this thing, thought it was very deep, very, very well done. Very, he got a lot of lot of accolades for it, but its sales wasn't there. And he's, you know, five million, like something like five million dollars invested in this, or some ridiculous sum of money. Not really ridiculous when you compare TV budgets, but still, for him to personally have staked this money it was it was a big a big spend. And so he was on Howard Stern talking about the fact, like, uh, yeah, um, this thing's put me millions of dollars in debt, you know, and this is an experiment, but you know, people didn't show up for it, etc. And you know, probably from I'm curious to know what's happened since then because I think that got a lot of attention to it. It put it on people's radar. And gentlemen, are you familiar with this? And what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, sure. I am, and I actually listened to another interview with him where he kind of went more into in, into depth on uh, on where he felt what he said on Howard Stern was was misinterpreted. Yeah, he's not broke. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 certainly not. And what he what he was saying, and so I, I haven't heard the Howard Stern interview but but uh, apparently is more clear in in the context of you know they they were talking about how he turns down a lot of stuff that Howard personally would have taken uh, specifically commercial stuff and and uh, and and for whatever reason Louis CK doesn't want to take it and so Howard was making fun of him for not and so when when the idea of like oh I'm millions of dollars in debt uh like that's where in the context of that that's where that was he says that he is in debt on the project, but right. that is not necessarily something that was outside of the plan for him, and it wasn't a surprise at this stage that really this is, and as you pointed out, uh, like just the beginning of its life to the wider world. And everything else that we've seen up till this point was the idea that, uh, or, or, or was... Uh, you know, just him selling it to his audience, and and there, you know, it, it was meant to be ten episodes, and apparently, in episode ten has a ending to it. So it wasn't like he made ten and then ran out of money and 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 stopped doing it. But his his plan is uh, to take this and sell it to a streaming service, and and that's like his the goal of this period of it to hear him tell it was to make back whatever he could on uh, on it episode by episode uh, and then build up hype and critical acclaim to uh, at which he's been fairly successful at uh, to basically uh, run it as an award an award season uh, favorite when that comes around and then sell it to like he he was mentioning more streaming services than television networks like Hulu or Vimeo or Netflix or something. And where I think that's interesting and smart is that he could package that as part of further involvement, further Louis CK involvement with whoever he makes a deal with, which I think is, he didn't spell out specifically, but I think could be something that if he wanted to do, he could do. I think, and that's, it's such an interesting point in time because like, yeah, I mean, you, you read the initial reports are like, ah, you know, he's going to be panhandling on the street because he bet it all. It's like, it's Louis C.K. I mean, this guy, you know, he, he's, 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 he's going to be, he's, he's going to be fine and he has a bigger plan towards it. But I, I would say that it, it, it was from his interviews. So it, it clearly didn't get as have the kind of traction that he hoped for initially, which may have to deal with, I don't know, there's not even a single trailer for it on his website. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, it's still it's still a very interesting, you know, the, the age that we live in, because I think the thing that can kind of get easily lost is that, like, oh, was success or was it a failure, is that, you know, here's a comedian who just dropped $5 million on his own TV series, that he can have a first life on the internet and then maybe flip it to Netflix or somewhere else like that. And it's, you know, we've, we talked about this ages and ages and ages ago about how the age of the producer, the producer is the creator really becomes, you know, is, is, is coming about to some degree and not always easily at first. And there's going to be a lot of missteps 
you know, when J.K. Rowling, they launched Pottermore, you know, they wanted to create this environment where that was the only place you could get the Harry Potter books. It was going to be this, you know, big, uh, vibrant online community for Harry Potter fans, but it probably came five years too late. And, you know, they then made, you know, deals to have those books, you know, available elsewhere. Yeah. But clearly Potter is a very, very big property. You talk to anybody who goes to Universal Studios, either in Orlando or here, and they tell you, you know, it's packed. It's packed. It's huge. You know, we're getting a new movie coming out, you know, set in that universe. We're going to get The Cursed Child is going to be released as a book and as a play. So there's certainly a tremendous amount of life to that you know, enterprise. It's just how you shape these things is what's curious. I, uh, well, talking about shaping things, I am really, really shocked at the, uh, what seems to me a fairly sloppy use of language. Like, I don't know who was the first to say the phrase, uh, I'm millions of dollars in debt. I guess Louis C.K. said it. If he said it, that was an astonishingly poor choice of words because the fact is he spent money that he had uh, with the hopes of getting a bigger return. And as of yet, the investment he made has not yet proven profitable. That's that's like it's the equivalent. Like I, I if if I were to cash out a four hundred one k or whatever and spend yeah. fifty thousand dollars on Tesla stock, I wouldn't say you know if Tesla stock didn't move overnight or it didn't do as well as I wanted it to. I wouldn't say I'm now fifty thousand dollars in debt. I would say my investment has yet to pay off in this regard. He said he took out a credit line to finance this. Well, though, so but owes... that's fine. He took it out against existing assets, though. He's not in debt. I mean, he owes somebody five million dollars. I, I, I guess. I don't know. Oh, it's... yeah. So so on and, and the, the the interview that I'm referring to is 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 interview with Bill Simmons on the Bill Simmons podcast. He says that based on on how it is selling now, he will be paid off uh, in his credit line by the summer, which he says is a success compared to yeah. because he has he has uh, participation in Louis profits with with FX that like those projects and and you know who knows how weird that accounting is uh, that those projects uh, like a season of Louis stays in debt far longer than he will stay in debt for this one uh, yeah, and, I think and I guess where we where we get weird is the idea that you know he is referring to himself as he in multiple entities. There is the producer for Horace and Pete, there is Louis C.K. the comedian, and there is Louis C.K. the writer, and there are boundaries there, although how firm they I, are, no. I, I very much think it's gonna be a success. I think it's gonna probably be, as a percentage, far, financially speaking, probably more successful than most TV shows are. Not maybe overall gross, but as a percentage of what he put in, what he'll get out of. Absolutely believe that. But I do, I would, I would, I would say, Samantha, like, no, when you take out a credit line, that's debt doesn't mean it's a bad idea but it's yeah. still debt you know somebody has a debt note that says you owe this and he's going to pay it off by summer so you know it'll... yeah uh but i think it's 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 really really interesting because because i i mean ultimately he's the one who took this risk right he's yeah. the one who went out and did it exactly how he wanted to do it and we can look at that and say and i that is an instinct for which I am willing to admit I am fully capable of looking at the efforts of other people and saying, yeah, but this is how they should have done it, right? And sometimes that is healthy and good in that it helps think and visualize of how you will handle your own projects. And sometimes that is negative in that you are thinking more about the, the criticism of others than you are thinking about the furthering of yourself. But uh, I, I definitely think, you know, Andrew and I were emailing uh, back and forth about this uh, a little bit this week. And, and one of the things that I said is that up till the entire 10 episodes were out and he was putting them out week by week, you had to get out your credit card and pay for each episode week by week. And I'm like, if you do that, you hate your fans. <laughs> like you, if somebody asked me to do that and spend like not a re auto recur, like just like, yeah, no, get out your credit card and pay for the next episode every week. Like, I, I would be annoyed by that. See, you think it, regardless of how good the qual the quality of the content is, you feel like it was an inherently flawed rollout uh, or, or distribution. Oh, no, I mean, I think that would be a point in which I would say, hey, listen, I'm not going to tell you how many episodes there are of this. Uh, you can cancel at any point, but uh, this is just going to auto-recur. If you if you click on this, it will auto, it'll be an auto-recurring payment, and you don't have to get your episodes, and I'll just email you the episodes each week when it uploads, yeah, right? I, I, I... 
I, you know, armchair wise can sit there and take apart a lot of the ways he did the rollout and a lot of what he did that. I will give him credit, one, for being a guy that's that's putting his money where his mouth is and doing that. And two, one of my what it still gets me to this day, and this happened maybe fifteen years ago, was what, and I mentioned and I, this before this, what, what what's that? Oh, that's that was weird. We're getting some weird uh, slap back here. Not sure why. Yeah, we're getting no. some Am I still here? Yeah, no, you're good. You're okay. good. Yeah, take it again. Something that happened a long time ago, but I still get frustrated by, was when Stephen King did The Plant. Uh-huh. Where where he said, pay what you want? Well, it started off like, yeah, pay what you want, but I expect it to be, this is what I think is fair. And you could download it, and you don't have to pay me anything. But his plan was, is that people would pay for installments of the story. Um. And then people started downloading the first few episodes, and then it started to decline, and then this was 16 years ago. And then what happened was uh, a lot of the downloads were people weren't paying for them, and he got frustrated and said, all right, I'm ending this right now, and I won't release it till later on. So it took him a long time before he finally released the plant. As you can see on his website, he finally gave it away. But if you're one of those people like, I don't know, me, who was buying it, and then all of a sudden he says, oh, too many of you are you know, not paying for this. I'm stopping this experiment. It was as just, but that was punishing. You know, I was really punishing your 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 biggest fans. Yeah, because I'm like, wait, I I can't control those other people. Yet you just took out your anger with them on me. And where Louis, in his weird sort of way, was like, well, I don't want to. I'm, I don't want to. You know, he didn't want to do like a package deal and all. It was. It it would be. I would say that it could probably use some evolving as far as his pricing strategy on it but i think that he does have arguments for why he was trying to be fair in the way that he sees it and and i think what is what is interesting is that louis ck I, I believe with this project and i'm a watch horse and beat so i can't vouch for the quality but people that critics that i enjoy have liked it uh he did something that showed a clear difference of like okay well let's really understand what a network what a larger structure what a platform can provide because listen it it's real you know there are there are great benefits to being on a larger stage and there are great benefits to being part of a larger corporation that has things like PR agents that are making sure that they call and get the same story and the same press release and the same press access planted in, in 50 different outlets all timed to launch around the same 48 hour window. Uh, and yet it's like, well, from a producer's perspective, if he like, if we only look at what Horace and Pete has done as just total bonus head start both press and money to uh, then eventually lead to the very basic idea of just selling it to a streaming service, which happens 50,000 times uh, a, a day, right? Considering how many streaming services are out there, uh, then it's great, you know? Uh, you know, then, then, then we're the, to, to criticize it as anything other than a, a, a cool head start would be almost like missing the, the forest for the trees. Yeah, I think that, I think, should he flip it to Netflix or Hulu, all the fans that he has that didn't buy it the first time are probably going to be curious to try it when it's out there. Yeah. Well, so do, do you think that in such a public way, uh, presenting it this way, and, and whether it's deserve it or not, it maybe uh, has some kind of stink on it for for having been quote unquote canceled or not successful or quote unquote leaving him in debt or whatever do you think that in any way affects uh what he'll be able to get for it from a hulu or a netflix oh, or, no. or whatever i don't think so i mean I, I, I think that i think the thing they're going to look at is is it is, is the quality there and is it has all this attention made it more interesting if it pops up a netflix are people going to watch it are people going to want to go see it and i, I think that I think that in some markets, yeah, Brian, it might be, but you know, for regular broadcast TV, I think that that would be a problematic thing because it would be, oh, well, they're putting this failed internet thing here, but in streaming, it's a different world. All this brings me to the question I want to ask both of you. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a book, Station Breaker, right? Reviews on it been great. You know, it had a really good run of sales. I have not been pushing it, doing whatever I, I you know, I could, but it's done pretty good so far. Now it's you know doing a little happy, a little pace there, but not a great pace. And I could put money into doing things like right now, like go get pay like six hundred dollars to Kirkus to have Kirkus do a review, or go through the whole. You know, I can't do Publishers Weekly as a publisher because you got to do that three months before the book was published. 
three okay. months before the book was published, it didn't exist. So um, <laughs> doesn't quite work for me. But uh, there are things that I could do to try to raise the awareness. I could send out, you know, I could print up 100 copies and send out review copies to bunches of reviewers and all that and do that and try to do what every other publisher does to try to bring attention to something. It's an investment. And it's an investment that will take time, it'll take money that I could be spending on the next project. And the last time I was faced with this was, we'll say, first when I first did Angel Killer on my own, and then three months later, after I'm thinking maybe it's time to move on, it took off with, you know, surprising me. You both have really made big bets. Brian made a big bet launching scam stuff. You did it. In a smart, strategic way, you know, you came up with an Indiegogo, pa you know, package where people could buy stuff and you use that to then, you know, start this thing. But there was a consider, but it wasn't like they paid for everything. There was a considerable amount of time investment and economic investment on your part to launch this thing. What you did was get people involved early on to help do it. But this was, that was a big bet. Sure. Justin with the contender, you know, Justin with the contender, you took a thing that was a, a uh, 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 by far and away a Kickstarter success, and you and your compatriots are now putting a hell of a lot of time and effort into launching this into a bigger thing. Your thoughts, your advice. <clears throat> so, uh, man, this is a really good question because um, thank you. Well, be, well, because there's whenever you launch something, there's different vectors. First of all, there's uh, it's almost like a political campaign in that momentum matters and, um, you know, you really do only get a, a single chance to make a first impression and so on. Um, and, and the question is, how do you take something that's already out doing well, um, but but needs to gain momentum to start uh, that kind of landslide? I, 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 I got to tell you. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but but The Martian was in a similar situation, right? It was originally self-published and originally was well received, but but far from the from the landslide success that it became, or once it picked up momentum, uh, uh, I'm sure you've deconstructed. Uh, you could probably tell me the story of 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 some of the stuff that Andy Weir did to to help kick I, that. Yeah, I don't sandstorm. know. I don't know. I don't know what its traction was before Crown picked it up. Um, <clears throat> You know, in my own experience with Angel Killer, that was a book that was selling in the hundreds of thousands of copies before Harper Collins picked it up. And that was, I did it, I, I put it out there, I did some tweaking and did something, on, you know, to that effect, but uh, I didn't do, you know, a whole lot for, like, there. And, like, yeah, as Weir wrote a thing that he was serialized on his, you know, website and then put it out on Amazon at 99 cents, um, you know, and, yeah, he did 35,000 copies in three months, Uh um, well, so, and that's so, interesting because, like, I sold, I'd sold, not to compare, like, I sold over 100,000 copies of Angel Killer before I got a publishing deal. Well, and, and also, like, Angel Killer had become a, a pocket uh, uh, smash hit in the UK. For whatever reason, that market yeah. really lit on fire. Yeah, for, for and Angel I did 35,000 in the US easily. Yeah. Too. So it's it's a curious sort of thing. Um, uh, and that, obviously, that book now, you know, third book is sitting in front of me and the TV project is, you know, taking its own sweet TV time and it has a life of that. Which, by the way, I absolutely adore the fact that 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 in the background, you know, stuff is simmering and brewing and happening. But but meanwhile, the fact that, that you're already on to to launching the next bet, you know, having these these parallel projects is oh, such the right, smart way to yeah, do it. Because, like, you know, uh, there when it's come time, when it comes time to promote the next Blackwood book, Jessica, I, you know, I'm going to go full tilt on that. But meanwhile, you know, I, I watched what would happen in the magic industry. And, and, and Justin was, you know, saw a lot of this, too. I would, you know, we knew the size of a magic industry was. We knew a product. You put out a magic trick. You'd sell maybe three or 400 copies if it was reasonably good to the collectors. And then maybe if it was, you know, had some momentum by that, you might do like 1,000 copies or whatever. And then that was kind of going to be it. There might be a little trickling sales. If it was a really, really successful product, like a really, really successful one that demoed great magic shops and all that, then there would be this sort of jump to like five to 10,000 copies. I would have friends that would put out magic books. They'd put out a book or a magic product, and they'd sell like 300 copies, right? They'd take out an ad in Magic Magazine and Genie Magazine. They'd sell 300 copies right away. And they're like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to take out more ads. And I'd be like, don't do it. Like, right. Well, what do you mean? I'm going to take out more ads. I'm like, it's because you reached everyone <laughs> with that first ad. Exactly. And, and that's the thing is they think that it's this much bigger market that they're going to get into, but it's a very small market. And you had, 
you reach saturation very, very quickly. And so, you know, there's a point at which you can keep throwing money after something. And I told him, like, write the next book. Just write the next book. Come up with the next product. product. Because, uh, Man, it's so th- this is a curious sky pickup. I've not encountered this before. I, I think it's passed if you want to keep going. Yeah, I'm trying to get my service upgraded, by the way, just so you know. Oh, right on. Just so you know. Not easy. Well, so, so what uh, do you feel like you've whittled down your your attractive options to one or two because i mean again there's doing some kind of giveaway or doing some kind of um uh, publicity stunt i mean that may seem a little bit crass but uh but uh, you know like, like that's certainly what i think of as pt barnum style stuff is, well, is figure out it, some it, big thing to do there are there are simple things i can do like i can take you know i can take the book and i could have like you know drop you know couple thousand dollars and sending getting getting it reviewed in places where the big boys have their books reviewed you know i could do that um i haven't done a lot of playing around with price elasticity or whatever like that you know i know if i i know if i drop it down to 99 cents it's going to jump up a bit but i'm trying to you know get into this area like i have how to write a novella in 24 hours has been doing great at a 399 ebook you know um and that's another thing is like the cure for writer's block which is probably a better book I haven't done anything to promote because, you know, I've been mines elsewhere. And so you get into that, how much time do I spend this? When do I make so, that bet? You know, so uh, is- I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, like, like Justin, like Justin, Justin, like, really talk, but like, how is the contender going for you right now? So the contender's in a very weird place right now. I mean, and not weird. Like it, it's 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 picked up more momentum sales wise on just the daily basis between our own website and Amazon. Uh, but we are at a point now where it's fairly clear that we are not going to get a lot of love from the tabletop community. Uh, You know, that, and, and selling party games to tabletop, like connoisseurs, like people who are like super into tabletop people that don't know us personally, like me or Brian or Andrew, uh, that's that's always going to be a harder sell because party games are kind of looked down upon as just, you know, very simple mechanics, stupid games that, you know, writers who aren't really game designers create. Uh, and so now we're in the process of kind of, uh, you know, being satisfied with whatever we were going to get there. And specifically, that was also tailored to uh, our wholesale options and our... Uh, you know, just larger uh, market marketability within tabletop. Like specifically, like we were a finalist for the Will Wheaton show tabletop. We didn't get that, uh, which is disappointing, but you know, whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, now the idea is, okay, so let's take that, um, take our energy that was focused on this more qualified, although smaller and more challenging niche. And let's now focus more on the kind of broader, are you just into f- having a good time and politics like the, the 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 John Oliver crowd right and so that's what we've spent which is a lot larger of an audience right but is not necessarily a uh you know one that wants to buy a card game you know maybe they they played cards against humanity once and they either liked it or didn't like it so uh, the, the what, what we're we, we've spent the last couple of weeks doing is trying to retool our social media and and our own kind of outlook to be a little bit more that with 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 the brand being we're funny and we're you know po- uh, political right and and that's the 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 big difference between what we were thinking about before which was like hey let's do live gameplay streams on Twitch and like you know that's that's one community. The other community is like what we've been working on, which is a lot of these funny, shareable viral videos and clips and stuff that's designed to kind of get out there. And and that's what we're focusing on. But, you know, listen, uh, I'm not going to lie. It's it's a uh, it's hard it, it, and it's it's mentally challenging and draining to keep your eye on the ball and be self-critical, uh, but yet don't let it kind of. Get well, to you. what one of the things I feel like the contender is uh, in uh, um, 
one of the things you always want to do is have some reason to reach out to people about what's new related to the same thing. And, and in that regard, uh, uh, scam, scam stuff is very fortunate because every single week we try to have a new release. If we don't have a new release, we have a particular contest or we have a new, uh, 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 there, there's some organic reason to reach out about scam stuff every single week in an ongoing basis for station breaker. That's, that becomes a little more challenging. I do feel like, like on paper, the contender should have been, I'm, I'm using air quotes, um, it, it wouldn't have been surprising. If the contender was like most game releases, it would have, it would have, you would have had the announcement that it's uh, Kickstarter, the announcement that you made it, and then maybe the announcement that you hit a stretch goal, and then that's it, right? But you yeah. guys have done a tremendous job of figuring out a way to, uh, part of it is that it happens to be an election year, so it's a lot easier for you to come up with reasons why it's relevant for you to come back and show up in people's inbox feed over and over and over again. Um, I wonder, uh, some of the traditional things that you get to do uh, with Station Breaker is, and I don't know how much of this interests you at all, Andrew, but it's like, you know... Um, you you can get on smaller media outlets to talk about anything newsworthy every time every time SpaceX does a thing and uh, or or for example like last week when they were talking about uh, or two weeks ago when we were talking about uh, uh, using light to you know push stuff to Alpha Centauri or whatever uh, you could have a take like the traditional author's route is to have a take send out a press release author of science fiction author award winner of blank star of this show you know has a counterpoint to you know neil degrasse tyson's opinion about blank or whatever um and then that gets you out there and then that uh, you know station breaker in other words you could kind of without too much trouble i think you could take the weird things show on the road out to other podcasts on the the low end you know other media outlets like television on the higher end uh, and get the chance to plug your book because you have all the legit credentials at this point. Oh yeah, I, I mean I agree, Brian. That was you know kind of a, a, an early thing. We talked about it here. You know, the plan was you know to maybe do a separate YouTube just space sort of channel and do that. And and those are things that you know when I find that you know it's it's deciding okay when do I dive into that and and kind of for me it's kind of like but right now I know that like oh I can I can write a check right now with you know a couple days worth of work you know have books out there and take in and, and, and not yeah. have to spend weeks you know a, a non, and i would like to do that kind of like be speak more about space and stuff and those things and part of the reason i wrote station breakers because it's kind of an excuse to be able to go do that but to build up the credibility of the book then maybe i need to go do things like you know what i saw with angel killer and name of the devil once i got those kirkus starred reviews and it was a starred review and now with name of the devil if i may drop it again finalist for the thriller award you know you see that credibility come into play for uh that. Uh, to to get back to your initial question of whether or not you should do it, I think it is it is worth it for you to do it. Not only because I think Station Breaker is a good enough and interesting and awesome novel that it has like it will warrant you putting the effort and therefore garnering the attention for it, but also because you know this is a a, a pivotal book and 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 much in the same way that I look at the Contender that you know. The contender to, can underperform my wildest expectations, which is like, you know, two reprints and we always sell X amount each year with a bump, a bump for election years, right? Forever. It basically becomes an annuity. It's like you you wrote Monopoly and it just makes money forever. Yeah, and we, and we can undersell that. And let's say we just barely make back our initial big bet investment, which on one hand would be awesome that we sold X amount of games. On the other hand would be a bummer that we're not like, you know, rich enough to buy a boat um but at the end of the day what i also have is now credibility as a game designer as a tabletop game designer as a party game designer and you already have x amount of credibility as a published author somebody who has done it independently someone who has done it with a publisher but this book and i believe where you are uh right now as as an author i think would benefit very greatly from you having another independent published hit on your hands and 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 another one that goes from just your brain and your and your computer uh uh to being 
courted by publishers. In the That's same- a really good point because I do agree because uh, so much of momentum is the story. It's it's kind of like we were talking about you know what makes for a good ghost photo or whatever. That's part of what makes a for ghost. <laughs> well, that that's part of what makes for a hit. I mean, a big part of why The Martian was such a compelling story to watch it ascend to become a movie and so on was because of that momentum. And I, I think I think Justin's 100% right, where it's like it absolutely clicks into your narrative to have, you know, to, to, to have this moment of uh, releasing another independent hit and basically, you know, doing it all over again. Well taken, gentlemen. Well taken. Uh, but, you know, these are the kind of things that you need to think about because very often I think you can you can very much frustrate and burn out your motivation by not knowing when the right spots are to kind of go all in and, and, and the right spots are to say, all right, do I cut my losses here? Do I keep going? Do I, do I continue to double down here? Uh, is this just me putting in my own internal resistance uh, because I'm being lazy or is this the right decision for me to focus on something else? And it's, it's hard. And, and, and very often you have to make, you have to run down a lot of dead ends and realize they're dead ends before you realize like, Oh no, no, no. I know where this is going and I know what's going to happen here. And you make decisions. And even then you can be wrong on both sides. You know, did you put an effort or do not put an effort? One of the things I talk about in my book, the uh, best-selling How to Write a Novella in 24 Hours, <laughs> is the creator's paradox. In that you get in the middle of a project and you can always come up with a more attractive project you should jump ship to. When you encounter resistance and things get difficult, you're like, yeah, that's why I need to go work on this thing. And for me, I solved that problem for myself. I'm very good at finishing things. I've got a lot of finished things that are just sitting there, though, you yeah. know, just sitting around like – you know, I think Justin and uh, maybe Brian to some degree know how many unpublished novels I have that I just sit on. And because it's that, well, I can finish the book, but then to take it to the next step is, you know, and even it, it is the weakest part for me because that's when it takes a lot of time and things are drawn out. Uh, which, by the way, I have nothing but mad respect for your ability to do. We were talking uh, just the other day. Uh, Bonnie and I went to uh, uh, this meetup and the question got brought up like what's your blind spot and it was like there was no hesitation for me to say finishing things I, I love 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 starting stuff not so good at finishing I get to 80% and I'm like eh the rest writes itself I'm out yeah true and but I guess that, that and, but you know for me the realization is that you know I finished the book but then there's still I can finish a book make a finished looking book that people can hold in their hands and say hey here's a book but like you take like care for writer's block, right? Blog. Um, I've got like five reviews on this because I've not done anything to push or promote it. Versus how to write a novella, which oh, that's, is like that's interesting. Whereas, reviews. like, like your defined finish line, like, like you did the same thing. The the actual finish line is once you get it well reviewed and get it in the hands of a lot of people and get the word out on it. You're having a hard time with that last twenty percent on this. Yeah, because I I have done again. I've been pushing the humble bundle and all that, and I haven't done anything to push this book. But here's a book that's better than this: the how to write a novella. I've done nothing other than an occasional tweet or whatever to sort of, hey, guys, check this thing out. And that's one of the problems. It's like, I know I know the formula. I just haven't done the work. Yeah, well, uh, in that case, people. I don't have a lot of advice and or sympathy. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> hey, Brian. Brian, you just totally turned on him. You're just like, <laughs> well, uh, F you. Oh, F- no, well, I, I, by, by the way, that... <laughs> That only comes from a place where it's like I'm so guilty of the exact same thing myself. And so if uh, I, I can't give you a pass, uh, uh, you know, if, if I can't give myself a pass. I mean, listen, there's a certain element to success that involves self-delusion. And I think this is partly where that comes in is, is just saying like, hey, look, like this is a hard process to to do. Uh, listen, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to get up and and think every day what can i do today for the contender because between everything that i have done everything that i thought i was going to do and then forgot about and then i remember and then i feel bad about the fact that i forgot it uh every uh idea that i have that maybe is good or maybe isn't good uh everything that's you know been done and didn't get the results that i wanted do i try that again do you know like there's it it's for a million different reasons it it sucks to, to get up and think about that. And then, you know, sometimes you just need that, that lovely 
opiate of delusion that like like hey no just go and do something because it's all gonna work out fine <laughs> and yeah. just keep moving yeah did I move the rock up the hill or did i let it fall back down <clears throat> yeah you know and and the more that you try to i mean there is one thing that i would i will definitely say and this is something that i am very much guilty of and and some of uh you know people that uh that i've known that are very very talented have been uh, afflicted by this that you know you try to solve the problem in your head and that's smart that's strategic to a point when you over when you try to make it a perfect shot in your head it will almost always fail because either it's going to fail your expectations or it's going to be something that isn't as reactive as it needs to be to what is actually happening out there in the world and and that is hard you know uh and 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 it's it's very 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 discouraging when like you have to understand that maybe more effort doesn't uh, necessarily at least in in the in you know in your head uh doesn't necessarily translate to a more success you know uh, sometimes it is just the right persistent effort that that you know would do a better job is just go out get out there make a tweet you know put out an instagram make sure you you reply to the comments make sure you check the social media feeds all that boring stuff man like the more it's there the better off you're going to be yeah there's that you know, that problem that I was a guy that always wanted to have the perfect plan in my head. I was going to like, you know, figure out that one perfect single way to do it, you know, write one letter, make one phone call and have everything fall into place. And you find out that it could be a great idea, but it's that ain't so make messy it. though, because you could be a hundred percent right. And then just that particular at bat, it doesn't take. And then you could do the exact same thing again and have it hit a home run. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Oh yeah. And so I, I deal with people too who are like, Hey man, I had this idea three years before these other people did. I was sitting on a billion dollar idea. I'm like, no, you weren't, you know, it, there's, 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 you can billion dollar ideas are free, yeah. you know? A They're thousand everywhere. people had that idea, and you know, a hundred of those thousand people tried it, and out of those hundred people, ninety-nine of them did it at the wrong or, time or with the wrong or, partner or in unfortunate or even, circumstances. Or most of them didn't even try. I guess my was like, is it like you? You? They didn't even. They didn't even step foot out their door to make the thing happen. You oh, know, sure. Like that's you, put... that's the vast majority. I'm saying that even the people who do yeah. everything right still. There's environmental conditions beyond your control about whether or not it hits. I, I swear, uh, uh, we, we were very lucky this past week in that um, uh, our, our eighth or ninth episode of The Modern Rogue seems to have really taken off with the blogs, this how to create uh, hallucinations for the life of me. I cannot tell what's different about this episode from any other episode of Scam School, from any other episode of The Modern Rogue we've done. For whatever reason, it was just the right message that hit the right people at the right time, and it's done a half million views in the yeah, last I'll, ten days. I'll tell you— I you can get high without drugs. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, the Brian, title, the right? The title may have something to do with that. Well, well, that's that's the whole thing, right? And then other times we do equally sensationalist titles, and then people just get angry and they they vote it down, and they're all like, "Shut up, man! I didn't really get high." You know, it's 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 a weird alchemy, and I can't claim to understand it. I, all I know is that is that maximizing your at bats gets you to that point of you know, I, it's, it's, I, it's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree, but I will tell you this, is that I have been constantly frustrated when I deal with other enterprises that they go, we don't know, and they leave it at that. Not to say that you are, but I've had that where I've had like, we yeah, and some things magically, algorithmically happen, but a lot of times you dig deeper, you find out this, like, I don't know, I don't know why Angel Killer blew up like it did. I have no idea why it did. And we can say, oh, it's a great story. A lot of great stories out there. Right. I think that it probably had to do something with the Amazon recommendation algorithm. I think it had something to do with kind of a word of mouth thing. But I think there are probably some very objective reasons that are worth studying because I think that you, you, you're absolutely right. Sometimes it's just random, but other times you find out, nope, there was this thing that you didn't realize that happened behind the scenes. And I found that out about a lot, a lot of books that like you find out like all oh, these runaway successes. You find out like, oh yeah, you know, you think Twilight was a runaway? Well, guess what the publisher actually did? Yeah. Not to say that they did anything, but you find out that there are these things where you go, oh, you'll never replicate their success because you didn't know the thing that they did, and it wasn't being random; it was very methodical. Well, and, 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 and I, I guess that's my point: is we know what uh, in the in the uh, 
the large scale works. For example, you know, the casino, the casino knows for a fact that 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 its policy regarding how to play blackjack in the long term will yield 52 percent of the revenues going back to them. And they have the edge and they just want to maximize the amount of things they do. They don't know how any single hand of blackjack will go at any oh, given sure. time. They uh, they have a policy that in general works and that's all they've got. And I guess that's what I'm saying. And, and so. You know, in, in that in that respect, uh, even if you know you're doing everything right and it doesn't work out, just try to be more like the casino. Casino doesn't mope about its strategy; it just figures out how to get more more traffic through. And I, and I think it's key, key to know when you are like that's the, the frustrating thing about the traditional publishing industry is they don't know why things work, and then you the, the advice they'll give to writers like, well, you know, just keep doing it, and well, after a time, it can it can take off. It's like, well, I can take that strategy, which <laughs> is just to keep sitting down at the card game. Or I can come up with my own game, you yeah. know, and, that, no, and that's and, been my and, attitude is because like there's this just do this and it'll work sometimes. And it's like, well, maybe maybe there are strategies that do help. You know, there are well, ways to game it. And which there was there are. definitely when hacking the system came out, I talked to uh, one of the folks behind the scenes. And I was like, OK, so what can I do on my end? Uh, and, and the answer was so unhelpful. It was like, Oof. I mean, really just. Uh, you just get a lot of people to watch. That's what it all boils down to is you need a lot of people to watch it. And I was like, that's dumb. That's a dumb mission statement because I can't control that. You know what I can't control is whether or not it becomes a trending Twitter hashtag or whether or not whether or not it shows up in 12 media reviews or three media reviews. It's like, you know, that's the kind of thing. That's the needle you can move. Yep. Yep. Gentlemen. This has been a very helpful, depressing, and illuminating discussion. <laughs> uh, by the way, Are my we... pick is tonight's uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, uh, we're not doing picks just yet, Brian. Uh -oh. Okay, we haven't started picks yet, which, by the way, mine would be Game of Thrones. What yeah. we are going to say is if you oh, have okay. a business, my, a project, my... something you're working on, you want us to talk about it, send it to us at... Uh, Neshcom at gmail.com. Use the subject line, After Things, Weird Tank, and... Uh, we'd be happy to provide you with our wonderfully helpful business expertise. I say sarcastic. Yeah, wait, wait, air quotes around all that. Hey, Justin, all do you have a pick this week? Yeah, my pick is the game of the contender. <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, it's Game of Thrones, man. I'm so excited for Game of Thrones. I had to tell Ashley that uh, I wasn't going to watch it with her because she's in Boston and we're going to like barely pass each other to and from the airport tomorrow and i'm not gonna wait a week when i got to talk about it tomorrow on hotline monday so uh so i'm super pumped man i'm, I'm just i'm really excited like and also this is the first I mean, episode since maybe the third episode that i hadn't read the books what comes next to. yeah well that's just it like to me the show's finally beginning because we're in uncharted waters and everything by the way i do want to give a huge plug for Hot hotline monday and specifically I want to ask because uh, I've been I've been quietly tuning in here or there. Would mm -hmm. it be weird for me to call in just on that line? Oh, the goal is to do it, and what we really need to do is just get a special line like just for our friends. Um, yeah. To 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 call in because uh, I, I I want that's what I love when we came up with the idea that was part of it was that like there would just be it would be a soft way that all of our little network could chime in. Like anybody who just is into a thing or sees a movie, like, of course, obviously it's built on the audience talking about it and Scott and I talking about it. But if you want to just talk about Game of Thrones tomorrow, call in. Heck yes. Uh, but then also, uh, I think, well, you know, and, and I don't know, I'm not, this, this is not, there are no spoilers here, um, but there's my favorite part of, of the new episode of Game of Thrones was where uh, uh, Sir Jorah Mormont was like, man, uh, I'm really, really excited about the 2016 edition of the Contender expansion, and it's on pre-sale right now. So you can just go to thecontender.us and uh, and, and pre-order it. See, it says unavailable, but right under it, pre-order the 2016 expansion pack right now. Click on that. Bam, you have it in your life. Uh, we sent, I did final proofs on it yesterday. They're going to turn it around within six weeks, which means that within two months, everybody uh, will have it, whether you pre-ordered it or you ordered it as part of the Kickstarter this, by the way, is the biggest screw up we did on this Kickstarter. I think we did a lot of stuff right. Here's the thing we did way wrong. And that is we have now, for some backers, done four mailings, which is just unacceptable. Oh, oh, just how much money you wasted on shipping stuff? 
a time effort like you know and and part of it was like like if, if we building in the 2016 expansion was always going to be something that was going to be a separate mailing but there were other mistakes that we uh did not uh have put together uh and uh and that would be the biggest thing man is like uh we we did a really good job of thinking x far into the process and then you're thinking like all right well we got to the end of it and no, what mm. sweet summer children we were uh, to to not understand that uh, you know there's there's uh, you know yet more and so if we were to do it again we would definitely think about it in a different way but uh, but yeah no super uh, super excited for everybody to go ahead and get it we did I think it's super fun man some of the best cards that we've ever written are in that expansion so if you like the game go ahead and pick it up now right on sweet gentlemen yeah then after. Dr. Ken, Dr. Ken, fucking all the mamas, fucking all the mamas, Dr. Ken, Dr. Ken, fucking all the mamas, all the mamas again. To all of my Twitter followers who I asked to tune into this. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's the, uh, <laughs> if you, you could probably find it real fast, Bryce. That's, uh, that's uh, Dan Harmon rapping with Grey Worm from... <laughs> from <laughs> Uh, 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 Game of Thrones. Yeah, the Grey Worm from Game of Thrones turns out as a tremendous also fan. a singer, and uh, and yeah, uh, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if I mean this is certainly opposite of family friendly. <laughs> Here we go. Give it to Camille Nanjiani. Yeah. <laughs> this comes from the house rock and cock. Yo, 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 yo. Ready? Yo, yo, yo. Lay it on him. Yo, yo. Again, yo, yo, when it was touch your ten, I'm going to be here again when I go down to the evening room. I'm gonna fuck mama in her womb and uh, make her pregnant till she has a baby. I'm gonna fuck her. She said, maybe if I raise it with you, it'll be rich. But I said, whoa, it's gonna need another stitch. A peasy out of me, a peasy pleasy me. I'm gonna do it to you until you do it to me. I take you to a place you've never been. Cause I told you before, my name Ooh, is Dr. Yeah. Fuck Dr. Kim. Kim. Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. Fucking all the mamas. Fucking all the mamas. Hey, Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. Fucking all the mamas. Fucking all the mamas. Okay. Baby, bop, bop. Baby, bop, bop. She goes in her mother to fuck. I put her down the broom and to the tie. Put your mama on the pine saw and the turpentine. Got the oh, put the ceiling on the floor. I fucked your mama a little bit, then I fucked her some more. I put the fucked her from wall to wall, side to side. Fucked your mama in a narrow opening and then the wide. Back to again, back to again. Fucking on a mama, fucking on a mama. Great work! I'm slowly gonna do it to you then again. I'm gonna have a slave on me till you come again. I'm gonna march for your walls and free all your people. I'm gonna fuck up your churches and all your fucking steeples. I'm gonna bring all my armies inside your walls. Gonna fuck your mama so hard she's gonna think her name was Dr. Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming to Hermantown already. That's been our show. Shit slayed me. That that gray worm. He's a very talented singer. <laughs> Rally Richie, man. He's uh yeah. No, I was uh that was that was a fun episode. Yeah. And uh, this was a fun episode of Weird Things. Dude, it was good. It was good. Uh yeah, I I, I gotta record stuff. I bet uh, uh I bet Brand's downstairs. I'm going to go. Bye. I love you. All right. 
Good night, I, everybody. I, I, you watch Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? I watched it. I liked it. I thought it was funny. Yeah. Oh, did you? I haven't seen it yet. It's cute. It's cute, time. It's good. It's good. Uh, 